Good morning. Welcome to First UMC San Augustine on this uh, beginning of the Thanksgiving week. Uh, shall we praise God together? I will enter his cage with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for him. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for him. thanksgiving and praise for truly all life first comes from you all our hope comes from you father you have been faithful and so we give you the praise this morning in the name of the father son and holy spirit amen Amen. Well, friends, today we finish up the sermon series, Dining with Jesus, Breaking Bread, Dining with Jesus. And we finish up with a story that, uh, that's both fun and familiar. It comes from John chapter 6. It's the story when Jesus multiplies bread and fish and feeds the 5,000. So let's, let's hear the word of God read together. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. This is John 6, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Now he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's this boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and, and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. 
What a marvelous feast of a Thanksgiving miracle that, that Jesus gives right here. I mean, from five meager barley loaves and two fish, Jesus sends this crowd of over 5,000 people home with leftovers. <laughs> In one moment, there's, there's only enough bread for five baskets, probably less. But every time we turn around, it's like the bread just keeps on coming. It's like the fragments of fish have no end. I mean, one basket, two baskets, ten baskets come by. But really, it, it must have felt strange to see those five loaves at the beginning and the twelve baskets at the end. <laughs> and these people, these people gathered in the field, to listen to Jesus speak. These people aren't just hungry people. These people are hungry people. I know you know the difference. It's Thanksgiving week after all. I mean, they are hungry people. Now, on top of the crowds gathering far from the nearest supply of food, many of these people of ancient Israel, I mean, they lived in a constant paycheck to paycheck kind of state. Really, most of them had no clue where their <clears throat> excuse me, most of them had no clue where their next meal was gonna come from anyway. And the Roman government wasn't much help. I mean, they they just had taxes upon taxes, but they didn't actually help the people with their needs. So it's really no wonder they try to make Jesus king. I mean, sitting there in the evening breeze in this grassy open field with bellies finally full for the first time in your memory. They have what we would call blessed. <laughs> so they make Jesus, they try to make Jesus king. But for all these blessings, you gotta ask, why doesn't Jesus just let them make him king right there? Why does Jesus instead slip away into the silence? Look, at, look again at verse 14 and 15 with me, just in case you missed it. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. See, when the crowds went where Jesus was, their bellies were made full and the sick became healed. I mean, why would we not follow Jesus, Jesus if that's what happened when we showed up? I mean, it seems like there's so much to gain for those who follow Jesus. Prosperity, healing, a large family meal, all the good things of life that we rightly name as, as blessings around our own Thanksgiving tables, that's what the people find right there in the field where Jesus preaches. So with Jesus nowhere to be found, the crowds who have tasted the bread, well, they do what any sensible person would do. They begin a desperate search to find Jesus. Look at verse 22 now. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They're hunting for Jesus. They also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. Why are they not at work, right? <laughs> they are searching after Jesus because he fed them. Look how Jesus responds when they finally find him. This is verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them. Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. 
Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And this is a huge indictment that Jesus levels against this crowd. Essentially, Jesus says this. He says, you're not even searching for me for anything spiritual anymore. It's only because I fed you material blessings that you even crossed the sea. And Jesus goes a bit further. You put so much weight on bread and blessings, Jesus says. Bread and blessings that all perish. But you neglect the bread of true, eternal life. And naturally, the people are a bit confused. This is when Jesus begins to speak in those riddles we know so often him to speak in. And so they ask some reasonable questions to themselves. I mean, why else would we follow Jesus? I mean, can't he meet our needs? He gave us bread. Why else would we crown him as king? Can't he solve our problems? He healed our sick. He blessed us. I mean, is it right or is it wrong to thank God for our blessings? Can't God heal us? Doesn't God bless those who follow Christ? I mean, it's nice and all that Jesus offers eternal bread but what good is eternal bread if our daily need of bread is not met we want concrete answers we want concrete miracles so they asked jesus what exactly would you have us do jesus what really are you getting at listen to jesus response in verse 48 I am the bread of life, Jesus says. Your ancestors, they ate the manna bread in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, Jesus says, that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. It's a strange thing that Jesus says. He tells us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. What? <laughs> Am I the only one who, who, who wonders oftentimes why Jesus gives us such weird, cryptic answers time and time again? <laughs> And really, we want concrete answers. We want to know what's in it for us. So I got to ask, wouldn't our faith, wouldn't believing in God, wouldn't committing everything to Christ be so much easier if God simply gave thousands and thousands of dollars to those who truly follow Jesus? Wouldn't it be easier? I mean, wouldn't it be easier to, to give our all to God if Christians never got sick, if Christians never faced struggle, if Christians never lived paycheck to paycheck? I mean, wouldn't that make evangelism so much easier? We'd really, really, we'd have this place packed. <laughs> We'd have this church overflowing. And it's not like these, these things are impossible with God. With God, nothing is impossible. But instead, Jesus says some strange things like this. If you wish to follow, if you wish to find true life, you must take up your own cross. If you wish to find eternal life, you must count the cost. If you wish to find fullness of life right here and right now, you must walk the narrow path. Trade your own life 
for the bread of life that God offers. In other words, Jesus calls us to sacrifice, to lay down our lives, to set aside our own comforts. Turns out, there's not really a what's in it for me question. The road is full of the road of full gospel healing in the arms of God, Jesus says, is a narrow road that few people actually choose. Instead, most people aren't willing to fully embrace the life of Christ. After all, that's what Jesus means when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's saying, fully embrace this life that God is offering you. But instead, time and time again, we'd rather ask what's in it for me. Time and time again, we'd rather, we'd rather a large table of feasting on blessings that make our life comfortable. But Jesus speaks a tough truth. Our lives are often just one big desperate search for bread and butter that will only ever spoil with time. Listen to John chapter 6, verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The problem the problem is this, something we don't always name. The problem is we don't actually believe what Jesus says right here. He says that the only thing that ever gives true life is the full pursuit of God and the things of God. But we don't really believe this, do we? Because if we did believe this and fully believe this, we would never struggle to pray. I mean, instead, we would always want to be deeply connected with the heart of God. If we did believe that Jesus is the only true bread of life, we would give ourselves to serving others before we ever calculated the comforts that serve our own gain. Really, we're not all that different from the crowds who get offended by Jesus' definition of true life. Just think of what we give thanks for around our own Thanksgiving tables. We immediately think of our material blessings. Full bellies, full homes, full pockets. And maybe we go deeper. Maybe we thank God for our families and our friends, the relationships, the love around us. But have we gone to that deepest place? Have we truly thanked God for real life? And by thanking God, I don't just mean offering a warm praise. I mean truly believing what Jesus says is true. And not just seeking Jesus in hopes of gaining some ticket or in hopes of gaining some blessing. See, rarely do we genuinely give thanks for the gospel healing of life that only the bread of life can give. And in many ways, it seems so abstract. I mean, Jesus says some strange things. It seems so distant from the Thanksgiving feast right in front of our eyes, from the everyday struggle of our lives, from the tangible, concrete parts of who we are. But family without faith is pointless in the end. 
Wealth without true worship is empty in the end. Bread without the bread of life eventually runs dry. Still, some people I know, some people prefer the pleasures of this life. And the desperate pursuit of Jesus loses its shine as soon as they realize Jesus has called us to take up our cross, not to take up a silver fork. Look at verse 66. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Do you also wish to go away? Now there's a question for our Thanksgiving tables. Do we truly desire passing comforts more than gospel life? Are we more thankful for shallow material blessings while our heart sits far from a fully healed life in Christ. Do we also wish to go away? To pursue other ways of life as if they give more to our daily bread than the bread of life. See, Peter gives the only answer that makes sense after you've truly followed Jesus. He says in verse 68, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know. That means truly believe. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And in my mind, as words of that song echo, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Because Peter knows the truth. It's only in Jesus that he's ever found life, real life, life that speaks to that deepest part of who we are. Life that connects us to the Creator. Life that sets our path on that narrow road, but that narrow road of fullness of joy, fullness of peace, complete healing, fellowship with God. That's the life that should sit at our deepest level of giving thanks this week. Yes, we give thanks to God for the blessings, the external blessings, material blessings, the food on our table, clothes on our back, roof over our heads, yes. And, and yes, we, we go a bit deeper. <coughs> we give God thanks for the love around us, for our family, for our friends, for those who truly care. But may we not fail to let the deepest part be the primary aim of our giving thanks. That God in Jesus Christ has offered us a way not just to eternal life in the then and there, but to real, full, gospel healed life in fellowship with God right here and right now. That's the gift. That's the gift that deserves the highest level of praise and thanksgiving this Thanksgiving season. So may we give God thanks. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Friends, let's sing one more song together. I know you know it because I've played it many times. It's quite fitting. You 
are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Thanksgiving week, but may we know that we are blessed because of the life of Christ given to us. That's why we're blessed. No matter if we have empty tables or full tables, a roof over our head or we're struggling paycheck to paycheck, the gospel is the same. The deep blessed gift of God is the same. So may we go deeper than the surface this Thanksgiving and give God the true praise rightly due to God's name. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <laughs>